place and uh, got in there and just kind of paid my dues from the bottom up and just kind of been working my way up through the years. It's it's going to be uh, 29 years this year that I've been with the company and uh, come a long ways, man. Learned a lot of things. Um, it's the best company I've ever worked for. Um, a lot of us say that that worked there because we've been there for a long period of time. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it wasn't easy, man. I, I had to pay my dues. I really did. And, and starting out at the bottom, sweeping floors to where I'm at right now, I think I've accomplished quite a bit in the, in the amount of time that I've been there. Who did you apprentice for? Um, most notably would be English, John English. Uh, but I also worked with Jay Black, uh, Alan Hamill, Fred Stewart, uh, John Sir for a bit. Uh, and then doing stuff with Artis Sparza and Gene Baker and those guys. So I got a chance to work with all of them at, at one point. Uh, but John English is the one that I really would sit down with him and he was starting to show me stuff, especially the early relic, relicing type stuff. We, we learned stuff together. He was still kind of learning it as well. So we, we did a lot of things, bounced things off of each other back and forth. But uh, gotten to work with him was, uh, was the best. So part of being an apprentice is you're taking the best of, of these guys and yeah. you're putting it together into yeah. your own world. Yeah. That's part of it, uh, you know. We, a lot of the builders that are that are now like Dale Wilson and 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 uh, Paul Waller and Jason, Jason Smith, they all worked with with these builders that are either not with us anymore or have moved on. And uh, it's a it's a very intense uh, exploration of how to build a guitar. I mean, everybody has their own way of doing it. But you learn a little bit from this guy, go to this guy, learn a little bit from him, yeah. and you put it all together, and it and it usually comes out pretty good. Um, but these guys are the best in the business, and it's just a, an honor to be able to work with them, and and had to have worked with them, and uh, and to be able to be one of them now, it's uh, it's a, and it's an extreme honor. Yeah, man, I remember when when he first started, there was nothing. We had to, we were giving you orders. Yeah. And then the SRB number one hit, and Rob yeah. can talk about that later. Thanks. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> but uh, some of the some of the builders uh, John talks about, you, you know, that was the, uh, you know, the original custom shop team, and. Uh, as you can see, 1987, we're coming up on a, on a little anniversary for the custom shop. So um, we're, we're, we're all pretty proud about how, how far it's come. And a lot of really cool stuff coming up next year. Yeah. yeah. yeah I really <laughs> stuff can't we can't elaborate on just yet. But you'll see it soon. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. So um, the Dream Factory is, is the nickname that the, the custom shop kind of earned. Uh, and, and really what it was was... Um, it, it turned into um, a, a place where where folks like yourselves would come in and, and get guitars custom built and, and customized for different playing styles. Um, uh, you know, it turns out we we didn't intend for it to be. Uh, all, we, we couldn't have seen all the reasons why people would bring guitars in. You know. Um, you get a reputation for doing great reissues and guys don't want to take their 1963 Telecaster out on tour anymore and they, hey, you can go to Fender and get, get them to build you one that you can play. And uh, of course you get that guitar, you're like, hey, this is pretty, this is pretty good. Uh, so to this day, uh, we, we are still doing that and um, that's kind of what Brian and, and Joe and I, that's, that's what we do. And uh, this is our uh, custom, our 2016 custom guitar uh, design guide. And every year we bring the new design guide. Did everybody get one of these? Because if you haven't, uh, no. no? Uh, Jess, you want to grab a, a few off the table there and we can pass them around? Um, guys, I, I know we talked about this in the past. We've, this is our latest version and we've added some stuff and Joe's going to tell you a little bit about it. You know, for years, when I, I first started in the custom shop in 2002 and this is all I wanted. I go, I need something I can take home and look at. I just kind of go through all the different specifications that we have, different colors, neck shapes, and design guitars, because we do a lot of it. In here, in this book, basically, you can put your dream guitar together, no problem. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, however many guitars you want. But it's, we've got, for the first time, all of the, the colors listed in here, the samples, we have neck shape dimensions, so you can look at it and get a general idea of, you know, what you're going to get. If, I mean, Frank's got just about everything here, but all the wiring diagrams, fret sizes, and and more you know, uh, Joe and, and 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 Mike Lewis and the team they kind of they they work on this every year. We listen to what you guys are asking for, looking for, and we try to make this um, this guide more robust every year. 
uh, and nice. somebody was asking about uh, cooked woods. So uh, I don't know if the 2017, oh, but yeah. in, okay, so yeah, Pretty in 2017, nice. you're going to start to see the different cooked woods that we can do. Some pickup um, specifications. Yeah, and, and, and pickups. So we're, we're constantly adding to this. And, um, you know, as Joe and I like to say, there's no wrong way to order a guitar. You don't have to... Uh, you don't have to use the guide. It's it's kind of there for you to kind of think up stuff. You know, I, I love the color page because it gives you that that physical right look at what some of these colors. You're like, I think I might like a lime green metallic. It's really representative, yeah. Yeah. The actual color. The book will kind of answer any questions that you might have, but it's also great that we're here today. So if you have any other off the wall questions that maybe you don't see in that book, we might be able to answer them for you today. Yeah. So next year, this is going to come with every guitar. We're having these new cases designed, and we're also next year going to have this little trifold that has this certificate in there. The actual build sheet that these guys use, it's it's unbelievable. They call it the shop floor the traveler. traveler. Have the coffee yeah. stains on it. Told them not to write cuss words on it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I um, got a shop traveler with my Strat. Yeah. Oh, cool. But my earlier guitar, I tell you, I never got a shop traveler. Send Didn't know I should add one. Serial number. Send no. Better still, you guys called me. Somebody had it written down that I never got a shop trailer. Oh, they cool. called me up and said, hey, well, you own blah, blah, blah. We can send you out the specs. I'm like, oh, thank you very Pretty much. Cool. Yeah. So, so you register your, your custom shop guitars. Yeah, sure. yeah. And I guess that's how they found me. That's, that was so that's awesome. That's what we're really working cool. towards. Yeah, that's that what we're working towards. Support. That was and, cool. You know, Frank and, and, and his team are here, and we've kind of pulled back the curtain. And this is, this is we're, we're his guys, you know. So if, uh, like I said, if you have just an idea of what I want, like that, that I love that '50s telly, but you wanna, you wanna figure out what's right for you. We have this guide. We have some stuff on the website, um, or you can call and chat with Frank, or we can get some emails going. What, whatever it takes. It's there's a. There's a lot of different ways to order, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the it's just us. We try yeah, to make it's it just as simple us. <laughs> and, and the easiest possible. Yeah, I mean, it's just like that. Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about next. Last year we talked a lot about relics. It was a, a big anniversary for the for the relic. We talked about relics a lot, and um, every, each time we do one of these, we like to talk about one of the processes that, that we do uh, in custom building. And the net process, to me, is so amazing. You know, we have uh, tours around the factory, and a lot of people, they, they come away from it saying, I can't believe how many, how, how hands-on, how many hands touch a neck uh, during this process. And since we have John here today, John has a really uh, a cool history with um, the net process because you were uh, apprenticed to one of the, you know, one of the all-time best uh, uh, builders. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Herbie? Yeah, Herbie Gasolumi is still with Fender right now. He started in 1961, and he's like one of the last pioneers that's left at the, at the shop, in the custom shop. We're lucky to have him. Uh, when I first started at Fender, I was, like I said, I worked at the bottom, cleaning floors and doing this and that. And started moving around working in different areas and eventually got hired into the neck department and uh, that was really really good for me because it was it taught me how to build the neck from scratch up and one of the guys I worked with was Herbie whose bench was right next to mine so he taught me how to do neck shaping and certain ways to, to sand the neck and not to ruin it you know there's just ways you've got to know how to sand to, to make it right and it was just great to get the, the few years that I did work with him there doing that and uh, those are times I'll never forget. And he's getting ready to retire pretty soon. I'm going to be really sad about it. But uh, it's just great to know that we have guys like that there to kind of pass on their torch to us to continue on. And I hope someday when I retire, I can do that to the next generation of builders that's coming through. But, uh, yeah, it's good to have those kind of guys there to uh, show us the way that they did it back in the day. And we carry on the tradition. So as you can see in some of the images I'm showing you, like the, um, that press right there, it's, it's foot operated. And it's just an old old school uh, tool that they use, and it and it uh, presses the frets in, and uh, they're all clipped then by hand and and, and rolled, and uh, it's 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 pretty impressive uh, when you see. This is a great video, actually. Joe took this, and you can see 
there's different stations that your neck will go down uh, in 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 the, uh, this is the team build area. So this is covert and ops here now. <laughs> I'm gonna film this, and you can't film it. Okay. Joe, so really pulling back the curtain, but you can see where they're buffing, they're sanding, they're shaping, they're measuring, uh, and you know, you go bit by bit, more and more. I think somebody <laughs> was just like, "Hey, yeah, it's <laughs> enough. Get out." Yeah, this is. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, that's. But my uh, thumb, my bad thumb. Yeah, but he he went there to do that just to to really show to kind of pull back the curtain and show that yeah there are there's you know different there's different stations and and you saw the what they call the dot smashers right yeah. they, they're putting all those side dots in yep. by hand yep. and I'm sure there's a machine that could do it I'm sure there's a machine that could, you know put those frets in yep. and everything but there's um, there's something about uh, the way that uh, Leo wanted the guitars to be built and that's the way they do them in the custom shop might not affect the tone because you did it by hand uh, but it it's what we call the mojo, right? Yeah. It's funny that on that video it shows them like on, the, on these edge sanders and they're grinding in the neck like that. When I first started doing this, we weren't using those machines. We were using these, these sanders, they're called bag sanders. So they're round bag sanders, you fill them with air and, there, and there's a certain touch you gotta have on the neck to be able to, you know, you're doing this with the neck to shape it and everything. And back like this, back and forth like this. They figure out a new way to do it with those, with those grind sanders like that. And they work, they're really consistent in getting a good product that way. If you didn't know how to use those back centers, you could ruin a neck like that. And I did ruin quite a few necks at the beginning <laughs> until Herbie got a hold of me and showed me, hey, you got a little a little bit more air out of your tires, so to speak, and that's the, the back center. A little bit more air out, a little bit more cushion to it. You got to have a rhythm to it, not so much weight into it. And there's all kinds of little things that he taught me that uh, taught me how to build a really great neck, good feeling neck. You know, when we bring uh, guests through the shop, the neck area is always the one area where everybody's just, their mind is blown. Because that's just a small piece of it. I mean, every single angle, every measurement is done by hand. I mean, the necks are pretty big when they when they come out of the yeah. machine. So this is all sanded down. Like, I mean. Yeah. And they, you guys know, you pick up a custom shop guitar, you, you feel the neck, it's arguably one yeah. of the most important things, if not the most I important. I think it's the most important. And no two necks are ever exactly the same. Even though we'll do a run of 10 guitars with the same neck specs on There might be a little nuance on one neck that's not quite on the other one. I mean, the, the, the basic spec is there, the way the, the customer wants it. But every one I feel is a little bit different. And that's a personality. That's like a mojo that goes into each one of the guitars. You can go to other guitar companies that are, you know, they spit out guitars and oh, consistently, and every one is exactly the same. Exactly. There's no soul to it. With yeah. Fender, you get that soul. Uh, which one guitar might not feel good. This is not the one, man. But Joe Blow will come up next to you and he'll pick up, oh man, this is the one I've been waiting for my whole life. So there's a, like a mojo factor to it that it just it fits in with every, we have a guitar for everybody, pretty you much. Do, you, do get, you do learn to appreciate those slight differences yeah. because that is really the difference between that guitar talking to you or talking to you. And yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. You play it and it's like, this is the yes, this yeah. is the one. And it's you know those those minute slight differences. So, um, thanks. Uh, so that was just a, a little section on on next. And uh, before we move on, uh, we're gonna talk about pickups. We brought a cool set of pickups here uh, to, that we're gonna give away uh, today. And John, yes. let's think of a good trivia question to give away a set of Strat pickups. Okay. First of all, these are these are hand wound pickups, um, and they're called uh, bone tones. And uh, I don't know if Justin or Ryan, you back there? Yeah, you yeah. grab those. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the bone tones. All right. So these are John Cruz. I was telling you earlier with the Ancho Poblanos that Justin played. You know, we're, we're, we're taking those vintage platforms and we're wind, custom winding pickups. So can you talk a little bit about what you wanted out of a pickup and why you made the, the bone tones? Yeah. This bone tone set is something that I worked with with Abigail before she retired. And um, I've been getting some requests from some of our Japanese distributors for something that's a little bit uh, not quite as hot. Uh, the Entreplomo is a great pickup. It's got a little bit more bite to it, which caters to a lot of people but there's some guys that got to have that clean bell chimey type sound so that is what these were modeled after and uh, it's basically an underwound pickup uh, 50 style pickup um, 
and I went through several sets with Abigail until I found the one that I liked. And this is the one, this is the formula that we ended up going with. Um, I started out just making a few sets for our Japanese distributors and they freaked out. And all of a sudden they started, I started getting orders for them and more and more and more. And now it's turned out to be like probably my favorite pickup for a Stratocaster because it's very low output. Uh, there's no hiding, man. You, you plug it into a nice clean amp and it just chimes, it rings really good. And when you say underwound, um, can you explain to everybody what? Well, what it's just it's about? it's like I said, it's underwound. It's less wine, so the so readings, a standard fifties pickup would have a certain number of wines. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then this is just a little bit under that, so the, the readings of it are, are substantial, lower. But I did that on purpose because I want more of a cleaner sounding pickup for cleans and stuff. But if you drive it like you put a tube screamer or your favorite distortion pedal in there and lean into it a little bit harder. And really dig into those strings it, it responds to it it's very touch sensitive from clean to dirty and everything in between that's why i named it bone tone pickup because everything you put into it with the bones of your finger you're going to break out a new type of tone to it i think that that's what named that pickup for me and it, it's, a, it's a great pickup who's actually winding that you uh, no actually if you look at the back here you no. will see this is the this is the lady that took abigail's spot josephina's, josephina's. josephina's. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So oh, and all those are too. All the bone tone pickups are hand wound pickups by Josefina with my specs. Okay. Um, does does anybody know uh, Josefina has taken the mantle as our as our lead winder uh, from a lady who was one of Leo's original employees. Uh, this is Josefina, by the way. And does anybody know uh, that lady's name? Abigail Ibarra. Abigail. All right. Pickups are right here. <laughs> Good answer. All right. You're just uh, waiting for that. That was too easy. We got we got <laughs> I'm trying to give them stuff away. We have another set here that'll eventually And I'm gonna uh, think of the next question. Yeah, so start okay. putting your All right. caps on. So um I've got uh, two in incredibly short videos here, but I just wanted to show you guys uh the difference uh between machine wound, which is right here. Um, so these are uh, like in, in, in Fender where, the, you know, we run, wind the, you know, the American pickups. They're, they're wound on a machine. There's a certain number of wines that um, each pickup should have, and they're very, they're very consistent and they're right on the money. Uh, we also do that in the custom shop, but in the custom shop we do something called hand winding. And when, if any of you are wondering why we were showing the signature on the back, um, that was the winder. And um, Abigail Yabar, you will see right here, hand winding is a little bit different. There is a human element right here. You'll see Abby thread that up and wind it on, on the spindle there. And what you can't see uh, is the very slight movement of, of her hand. Uh, and some people call it scatter winding. And the, the thing I always like to say is it, it makes these pickups snowflakes mm -hmm. because of the human uh, element. No two pickups can ever be wound exactly the yeah. same because it's they get into this rhythm. He talked yeah. about a rhythm with the neck sanding and there, there's a rhythm to the hand winding how. And, and almost all of the custom shop guitars that we get requests for that are in um, our collection, they're almost all hand wound um, these days because why not <laughs> we offer it and uh, yeah. yeah and and this is the way this is the way that they that they did it back in the day so um, yeah that was the pickups John's gonna do a demo a little later and and you guys will get to you guys will get to see him uh, uh, work on some pickups you can ask as many questions as you want um, but this last little bit of our of our presentation we're gonna talk about um, artists Rock stars. <laughs> rock stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, uh, some of you guys may have seen this um, slide before. Uh, you know, once again, I always like to give you the uh, uh, I give you the note. I, I don't put that up there to brag, but it's it's just to kind of underline the fact that um, these are the pros, and um, each one of these guys has come to one of our eight master builders and. Um, had a guitar or several guitars built or regularly have guitars built or have their own uh, signature model. Uh, and I, I you always want to just hammer home for you that um, through the music gallery, you have a vehicle to 
have a guitar built by the exact same builder <laughs> that you know Eric Clapton does or Jeff Beck does or whoever you you know you um, you know Joe Bonamassa wants to come in and have something built you can have something built by the same builder uh, and it's 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 pretty cool when you think about it. Have um, you noticed Frank always has Todd Krause built Eric Clapton's and Jeff Beck's yes in house always. Because he builds their guitars. And yeah, yeah, Frank makes it a point to, to do that. Like, this is the guitar that Eric would get from his builder. So. And as Eric makes changes to his guitar, we make these changes to our signature model, to everything we do. So, uh, throughout the years, we've had a lot of uh, artists come through the shop uh, and, and work with our builders. And... Um, John, you've, you've worked with a lot of artists and you've worked on a lot of projects, so, and you're working on a big one this year, one that's close to your heart. Uh, so we're gonna start with some of the projects that you've worked on in the past and of note, and uh, you tell us some stories and then we'll work our way into the, into the new one. Sure. Um, but before we get started, I, I just wanna say, um, does anybody know what um, we call this series of guitars when we, when we match uh, uh, something Nick for Nick and and we match the aging um, does anybody know what we call these guitars Signature? tributes tributes you already won <laughs> you <laughs> <All right>. everything. <laughs> hey so, can somebody okay. give me a tribute guitar that's not shown here Danny again all right I'll take that um, let's let's pick him a good prize from from the table there um, <clears throat> Joe, can you can you talk a little bit about um, because we do have some cool uh, anniversary and tribute and some cool artist stuff coming up. Can you talk a little bit about like the collectability of these guitars? Yeah, totally. First thing is we can't call them tributes anymore, so that question was a little. <laughs> but when I first started, one of the first things projects that I had on my on my uh, plate was the SRV number one, and John was new, like I said earlier. I was new, and we sold all of those in a day, day and a half, all gone, 100 worldwide. And John isn't going to build them all in one month or two months or three months. They're going to take some time to build. So when they first started going out, you know, guys were selling them for, you know, a, a good price. And as they, as more people started looking for them, guys would call me up and say, look, I want one of the last ones because there's a pattern happening here, the value of the ability. And we had you know, guys like John Mayer calling us, finding out who was going to get shipped the guitars in a certain month. But at the beginning, they were selling for about ten thousand dollars, and at the end, um, twenty-five grand was the going price. And now, I mean, I've seen them going for thirty thousand dollars when you, when you find them when they're available. And even with the John Mayer black one, mm -hmm. that thing sold out right away. Clap and blackie right away, and the values are are it's a good investment. That yeah, and to, and to a certain point, any any Fender Custom Shop guitar is a good investment. Um, this is obviously an extreme example of of how, uh, you know, they, they would rise in value. But um, well, the fact that we only did 100 pieces of Stevie's guitar, too, yeah. that's 100 worldwide. So if somebody from Highland Park got one of the 100 pieces, that's... You're gonna have to invest in a good security system at your home because somebody's gonna probably want to take it away from you. Right? And the crazy thing about it, the internet wasn't really, you know, as much of a marketplace right. as it is now. Right. So guys weren't really. Yep. It was phone call. Yeah. Yeah, and race. I, we've we've done shows all over the world. I remember one in Canada. John wasn't even there, but some guy brought his SRV one in and. Uh, and just you know, just to show us, and just to you know, break it out, and just to and and he thanked us. I didn't have anything to do with it, you know. But he thanked us. What a special guitar was. He was a huge Stevie fan, and I'm sure you hear from some Stevie fans. Yeah. We saw a guy with a tattoo, right? Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. I think his wife almost killed him. But. Yeah. But the coolest thing about this guitar, in my opinion, is typically with with the guitar, like these limited edition signature guitars, they have the actual guitar in the shop where they can look at it and uh, replicate it off of that, build, build a, a mule. John did this on images alone in video. He never touched the Never got guitar. to touch the guitar. So that was hard. But I had all the killer photos and video and stuff that I could take home and just burn it into my head what it's supposed to look like. And eventually came up with a prototype and sent it to Jimmy. 
and he looked at it and freaked out, started crying. It was uh, an emotional time, and, and signed off, and I told me that was uh, that's the way we're going to do it. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good when we get the chance to work with the the artist's guitar. Unfortunately for me, this being the first one, I had to hit it out of the park. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't get asked again to do it. But, but you did get asked again. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and so let's go from one that you never actually held to uh, one that you had to buy an airplane ticket for. Yeah, really. <laughs> this, is, this is the maestro. <laughs> Tell us about uh, the, the Malmsteen and um, and uh, you you did buy an airplane ticket for his yeah, guitar. Yeah, well, kind you? of. But I, I basically had it sitting next to me on the plane. Yeah. And he didn't want it under the belly of the plane. He was he made it quite adamant to me that this is not going to happen, or I'll have your you know, I'll have your head for it. But now uh, you and Ingve have become friends. We're great days. friends. Yeah. He's a great guy. And uh, can you talk a little bit about doing this project? Because yeah. there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of nicks and dings on this. Yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, challenge. we went out to spec the guitar uh, a few years before, and uh, it was a workhorse guitar. You could tell it's the one that he brought to America when he first came here, and uh, it's been from his first bands in the U.S. from Steeler through Rising Force uh, and everything in between that he's done. That guitar has been with him. So uh, when he finally retired it, and we we got some specs off of it, he was still playing it at the time, and it just kind of sat quiet for a couple of years. And then we finally said it's time. Um, I had to go back out and see the guitar again, and at that time he had retired the guitar. So I kind of like begged with him, is there, is there any way that I could take this guitar back with me to, you know, to get a better understanding of it? And when I go to make the prototype, I can have it right there with me, and make it one to one. And he kind of got silent for a second and says. He, you, know, you better take care of my guitar, man, and, and I don't want it going underneath the effing belly of the of the plane. I want it next to you, and I want you to buy the ticket. And whatever you say, Ingvay, I'll do it for you, you know? So we got the guitar back, and I had it in my area for four months, and uh, really got to become one with it and learn every little thing about that guitar. And I had to call him occasionally and ask some stories about it. How did this get there? He would tell me the, you know, how he did it. There's, there's actual bite marks in the guitar that I had to figure out how to do that. I wasn't going to do with my own teeth. You were teeth. biting it, weren't you? Well, I, I did the first, the first couple, then my teeth started hurt. I had to figure out another way to do it. But, uh, yeah, he was a wild man, and uh, I had to transfer that. You never took it home either, did you? I did take it home. <laughs> <laughs> Before I went to Germany to, to take him back the prototype that I made and his guitar for the, the music message show that goes on in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, I took the guitar home. And I just so happened to have my amp set up in the garage where I practiced and stuff. And my wife was gone, shopping with my daughter for the day. Two neighbors next door to me were gone because one of them was out of town. The other guys were working. I'm like, oh boy, yeah, it's on. 11 on my Marshalls. And I freaking laid into that guitar. It was unbelievable, man. It was like, it, was, it sounded so cool. And 10 minutes later, it's like, <laughs> it was the neighbor. And she says, I called the police on you. They're coming out. right." And the cops came. And they told me, you know, dude, you're going to have to turn that down. I'm like, hey, I'm sorry. But it was cool to have Ingvay's guitar in my house. I can't think of anybody else that's ever been able to do that. Yeah. And, uh, be able to play it. But, uh, yeah, it's just those kind of connections with the artists and to be able to work on a guitar like that and, and make it into something special. Uh, I don't remember how many we sold of those. I want to say it was like uh, 100 pieces, yeah. too. Okay, yeah. yeah. So how was it uh, when you finally gave it to Ingvay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it one more time because there's somebody new here. Doesn't know that. When, I, when, when I took him, the guitar, to Frankfurt Music Store, uh, Music Fair, uh, we laid it on a table much like this, and I put the original and the prototype next to each other, and it covered up with the black you know, linen thing on top of it. And he came in dressed like he's just got out of a plane and then going into concert with his sunglasses on indoors. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's all cool and everything, and all the cameras were glowing on him and, you know, the lights and everything. It was a big deal, you know. And he says, are you ready? He goes, yeah. And so we had him pull the thing back. He's pulling it back like this, and, you know, you see the headstock, you know, and it's working his feet on the neck, and he's, like, giggling and laughing. And I'm mortified just going, he's going to rip me apart, man. He's going to think <laughs> this is a piece of crap, man. And, and uh, he was very tickled with it and laughing, uncontrollable laugh, because it was like, this is unbelievable, un effing believable. He was doing that, and he's like, and he's, he's picking it up, and he's looking at it. He's like, How could you get the cracks the same? And that's documented on a film somewhere. It's, it's hilarious. But uh, I fooled him for a couple seconds because he didn't know which guitar was which. I mean, the straps and everything were aged just like his the yellow and the, the booze and whatever else, cigarettes <laughs> that was all over it was all there. The only way he could tell is when he flipped it over and saw that my name was on the back of the headstock, what all the master builders do. And he goes, Oh, man, that's cool. It's very cool, man. So. He loved it, signed off on it there, and the rest of the time it was just uh, have a great time at the show. 
But uh, that was my main concern is that if I could get it by him and he likes it, then I think the rest of the world's going to accept it, which they did. So uh, that was a, a good piece of history for me right there. That's awesome. Well, thank you for telling oh, that story. Yeah. I love that story. It's kind of a condensed version of it, but uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 censored. Yeah, censored yeah. version. All right. And um, I, I just want to, uh, I want to talk about the John Mayer for a minute because the thing that I think is so cool about this one is um, John is a notorious kind of, you know, guitar geek, I'm sure, as we all are, and he just likes to be around the custom shop and hang around and, and do stuff. And um, this was the first guitar um, that we did that we matched um, that was actually a custom shop guitar. Uh, so can, can you tell that yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. He wanted to come into the shop with Mike Eldred one day, who was uh, our, our uh, guy at the, at the shop for a, long, a lot of years, and it was telling me, you know, I want to be a part of making my own guitar. Mike's like, all right, let's go. Gave him a pair of glasses. They walked to the shop, you know, picked out some wood for body and stuff like that, and, uh, and basically put him to work. You know, you got Pretty Boy John with the perfect hair and everything, and he's walking around and looked totally out of place, man. He did not belong at all. Everybody's like, all the people working are like, who the hell is this guy? Man, all the cameras following him around. And he's sanding his body and everything, and, you know, and he's starting to get, like, sweaty and stuff. And I was just like, oh, this is cool. it's hilarious. But it was cool because he had a little part of every part of the guitar that he worked on. It didn't finish the whole thing, but did a little bit of it so they get the documentation of it. He was in the paint booth, and he painted it and everything. And I told him, like, at the end, like, take it down because he had like paint runs and it was pretty bad but it, you know he was there god bless him he did it but and he that, played and it, the heck out of it well he so. played the heck out of it but he, he gave it to me he wanted like Stevie Ray's guitar he wanted a heavy relic he wanted exactly like Stevie Ray's but but black and I says well I can't do it like Stevie's let me come up with something that's along the lines of that but it's going to be your own thing and which I did and then when I sent it to him he freaked out and loved it it turned out to be his favorite guitar and number one guitar for him for a few years I mean I saw yeah. him every early concert to all the way to the Michael Jackson Memorial uh, which was very emotional for me to see him playing that guitar on there mm -hmm. and uh, there was such a buzz about that guitar people were asking about it how can we get one of those guitars and, and John and, and Fender had talked about it about possibly doing an artist uh, uh, well, limited, Joe, limited edition wildfire, didn't they? yeah oh yeah yeah I was so. on vacation when they said green light go sell them I had my family up with Joe Owen from Black Path got on the phone I think you, you guys were helping too. Yeah. We just started dialing away. Yeah, within hours they were all. There they was were all 83 done. pieces that we did. It was an odd number, but it's a, a, again another low uh, number of guitars to do worldwide. So if anybody got one of those, it's going to be much along the same lines as the Stevie Ray Vaughan. You know, I, I don't remember what they went for at the time. It was a, it was a little bit similar. More. Yeah. Yeah, and and now they're like double the price if you could find one. Um, you know, there's been a lot of copies, people trying to copy, and I'm flattered by that. But this is the original one. And the ones that have them right there have got a piece of uh, piece of history there, definitely. So uh, this brings us to uh, this year's uh, newest one. This is something that is very uh, uh, close to your heart. It's, yeah. a, it's a passion project for you. Yeah. And it's something you've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Yeah. And it's got to be pretty... It's got to be pretty satisfying to see, like, as soon as it was announced, everyone went crazy. Yeah. This thing sold in, like, a minute. And yeah. uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the Gary Moore. Yeah, Gary, if a lot of people don't know, but some do, that Gary's, like, my all-time favorite guitar player. Uh, early on, man, I was just mesmerized by his playing style and aggression and just everything that he did with the guitar. It was just phenomenal. And I always remember him playing that Red Strat in the early days when I first saw him. And so when I got hired at Fender and they were walking me through, you know, uh, the tour of, the, of the, the plant before I started, and we had these big conveyors with all the bodies going through, there was a, a batch of about 150 Fiesta Red Strats, and I'm like looking at it going, wow, that's Gary's guitar right there, man. <laughs> so it always stuck with me. It's like, man, I'm going to be working in a company that does a guitar that they did for Gary Moore. So I always made it part of my goal that... I don't know how long it's going to take me to get up to the top to where I can actually make guitars, but I want to make him a guitar. And uh, it's very sad that it never happened because he died before uh, I got the chance to do it. But we were in negotiations, negotiations with him early on, and he wanted to do the guitar. It's just that we couldn't get it to, to gel up at the time because there was other contract uh, allegation, or allegations, obligations that he had uh, with another company that we won't speak about. But... Uh, we couldn't touch that and then after he died I, it, it kind of simmered down for a while and I brought it back to life again I brought it up and I says man you know you think now would probably be a good time to do this it's coming up on a you know 
landmark, you know, five years of him being gone. And uh, I'd, I'd talked to his, uh, the uh, people from the family, and they were totally into it. They were like, yeah, I mean, it would be in Gary's honor, this would be the right thing to do. So I was on it. Uh, they flew me out to, uh, to London to spend time with the guitar. And uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. I was shaking when I opened the case for the first time, and, and there it was, the guitar, you know. And uh, just to see it and take pictures of it and document it and take it all apart and everything to see what was going on with it, it was stock, a stock guitar coming out of that, the hands of that Irishman, strong hands. But it's like, if he could do that, then why couldn't somebody like you that wants to have one of these, that's a fan like me. It's basically a guitar made for the true fan of Gary Moore. That's what it was all about. So it's a limited uh, run, a very small run. We're doing 60 pieces yeah, worldwide. Yeah. And uh, if anybody's lucky enough to get one of those, uh, I think Frank might be getting yes, one here. Yes. So you guys might want to get in line out there if you really, uh, this, is, this is a labor of love for me. It's like my ultimate idol, hero. You'll see all the love that I put into this thing. Everything is exact like his guitar. The bottom side of the pick guard, you know, has this piece of tape in well, you it. Si and you signed it, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. I didn't sign it. That's what was written on the bottom of it. It was the guy that oh, okay. was working on his guitar put down that he changed out the pots on this date, you know, because one went bad. Oh, he left notes? He on left notes oh, on the guitar cool. so that if he took it apart years later, he'd go, oh, yeah, I remember we did that. And, and it was like in Norwalk, Connecticut or something like that where he did it. He signed it and dated it and everything. Oh, that's cool. So all those details are captured underneath the guitar. Um, you can see the pit. There's a picture of the the actual pick art and in my assembly and you put them both it's like a mirror image of the guitar so those kind of details go into the guitar uh everything that was in gary's guitar is what you're going to get and i made sure that i was going to do that and do it justice because uh i'm a true fan and you know hopefully someday these guys will think man johnny you did a great job in this we're going to give you one of these guitars because that's my goal <laughs> <laughs> that is my goal you know the, the cool thing we went out there in april he had the prototype built and we got to see the original next to the prototype, mm -hmm. it was unreal. They were so close that it was the day after we arrived, right? And yeah. We went and saw it. We're tired, man. We're jet lagged, and I'm holding what I think is the one he did. I'm like nodding off, and uh, the Graham, yeah, the uh, the tech is just looking at me, <laughs> and, I, and I look at him. I say, "Oh, this is the real one, isn't it?" I'm like, "Johnny did a great job." I'm trying to <laughs> collect it, but I, I mean, it was that close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh. It's kind of scary because he, this is a guitar that doesn't see the light of day anymore. It's it's put away carefully in a vault. That's where it'll reside for the rest of uh, eternity, I think. Uh, Gary doesn't play it anymore. Nobody else will play it. It's just a family. Uh, it's in the family now for, for life. But we're glad to be able to share it with the world now. And hopefully people can get the same charge that I got on making it to be able to play it. Now, um, you and Joe went over there and there was a... Uh uh, a concert, right? They, yeah. There was yeah. what was a, it was, a celebration. It was a memorial concert for Gary. It was his birthday. They held it on Dave's birthday, and it was also the five-year anniversary of his death. And um, it was a big concert. The guy standing to the uh, uh, to the right of me with a sweated-up shirt is uh, Cliff Moore. That's Gary's brother. He's a phenomenal guitar player too. It's not Gary, but he's very, very good. And over to the left, even more, if you look, there's only one girl on the stage over here. Mm -hmm. That's that's Gary's daughter, Lily, which was great. She was very emotional when this whole thing went down, and, and she sang one of Gary's songs. Pretty much brought me to tears when she sang it because it was just, it was such a charged night and such an emotional night. And then to have the guitar up there and have uh, 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 Henrik Frieschlatter from Germany, really great player over in Germany, blues guy, got to play the guitar for the first time on stage. And as the night went on, it just hung there on the stage while all the bands were playing and stuff. And at the end of the night, they pulled me up on stage to play. Of course, I grabbed that guitar. I'm like, okay, let's go. So we started playing. I got to throw some riffs on it. It was a charge, man. It was a great night. And uh, it was something I'll never forget. Yeah, so I think in this case, you really, um, out of all the tributes you do, you know, this one goes back to, to, to your youth and yeah. you oh, know, yeah. all, all those songs that you love. And I, I think, obviously, hearing John talk about it, you can, you, can, you can hear that it's not, we're not just building guitars, you know, it's very personal to him. And it's, it's, he, it's very special that he gets to, yeah. to make these. This is, a, too, he even know I have this. this is an emotional one, too, because I got to put the guitar next to Gary's grave, which. Some people say, that's disgusting. Why would you do something like that? It was for me that I wanted to share that with him. And well, we, 
we left him because yeah. he was like having a, he was having a conversation. Yeah, it was it was pretty awesome. I have great pictures of that, but I'm not gonna show them. But this is John. I don't even know if you can see it. He's playing the actual guitar here. Let me see if I can get this a little. We got video. So uh, we had a question over here. What yes, sir. Was the stock uh, guitar that Gary had? It was a '61. Yep. And it, and and the funny story is that we can't confirm it exactly, but back in those days, yeah. Oh, is that Gary's or is that mine? That's yours. It's Gary's. That's I'll show you yours. in a second. That's yours. Um, where was that? Uh, the guitar finish on that thing had been finished twice. Like it had an original Fiesta Red finish on top of it. But back in those days, there's a lot of stories going around about, you know, the big guy in Europe at that time and in those years was, was Hank Marvin. Everybody wanted to be Hank Marvin, have his exact guitar stuff. So they would send their guitars back to our... our, our uh, uh, our Fender guys over there uh, in, in, in Europe, and they would refinish the guitars in that color. Most of them like drastic colors, like black, and they wanted the Fiesta Red, like Hank Marvin Fiesta Red. I think Gary's guitar might have been in that same thing because it has a different layer of Fiesta Red on the top, which is a lot more pale. Some people call it salmon pink, mm -hmm. but I don't think there's really a such thing as a salmon pink, even though it kind of resembles that. This is a nickname that. Yeah, yeah. but it's a kind of a cool nickname, but yeah. it, it kind of, that's the, 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 the thing that we do. To match that guitar, we, we did those two different colors. So you'll see that as well on the guitar. I, I wish I could have brought it with me for you guys to see it. Uh, it was just. I don't know if you guys can see this one. Frank will have one eventually. Yeah. Well, it's not his best performance, but yeah. Yeah, I was just farting around. That's all I did. Great time to play that thing. That was cool. The killer guitar, though. Very low output pickups as well. I read them and everything. So the pickups that we're using in this are the same pickups that we gave away today. It's the same uh, low output pickup, and that's what Gary's was. Uh, <coughs> he depended on getting his tone from his fingers, his his uh, um, Ibanez tube screamer, which he used a lot of, and his of course his Marshalls that were you know pegged all the way. So he was a very loud player. And if anybody watches any old YouTube clips of him playing that guitar, or even the Strat Pack video that uh, was the 50 year anniversary of the Fender Stratocaster, mm -hmm. he played Red House on it. You can hear that guitar and what it, what it did. And hopefully uh, anybody that gets one of these will be able to do that same type of thing, uh, get that type of tone. These are the, uh, the ones that are in the Gary Moore will be the Bone Tone pickups, which is my design pickup. And they're hand wound pickups as well. <laughs> 